Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. On this show, I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Before I get on with the show, got to have a sponsored message. Today's episode, sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, you know what? We help the wine and craft beverage industry build stronger bonds between their customers through authentic content. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. You know, today I'm super excited. We've got a very interesting guest on the show. We're talking with Eamon McDonald, who's the founder and CEO of Pasmosa Sangria. Welcome to the show, Eamon. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, Eamon, I am so stoked you're on. We were, we've were we been talking kind of in, in passing together over the last couple of weeks about Sangria, and the, your, your product fascinates me. Tell us how, you, before we get into your history and your story, tell us how your Sangria is different, because it, it's, it's really shocking. So uh, what we did is uh, we seen in the market, I guess, probably in the on-premise market, there's really no great sangria. And uh, a long story short, I imported one from Belgium and uh, took off and run it with it, sold a couple thousand cases in the first year. And then my partner in it did not want a beer anymore. So I went to Spain and went to several wineries and, uh, and made our own. So no different than somebody going to uh, Mexico to make tequila. I felt the best place to make sangria in the world might be Spain or Portugal. And uh, we... we uh, Came up with a, a great brand that would hold up on ice. And, um, and that's the key. I don't want to cut you off, but I want to make sure everyone understands this. A lot of the sangria you have, or that once it gets to your lips, it's a, it's a watered down version of something that may or may not taste like wine. The right. thing that really stood out to me is that your, your sangria comes in at what, 12% alcohol? Comes in at 12% alcohol. It's designed to go on ice. And the plan behind it was when we put it on a cup of ice, it would hold up for 15 minutes. And it did. And it was kind of funny because in Europe, your ice cubes are about two inches in diameter and it's a big cube. And I went out and bought ice cubes at the local. This was kind of funny. I go out and I buy ice cubes at like their local 7-Eleven and I come back and I'm breaking the ice cubes into pieces. And the guy's looking at me like I'm nuts. He's a third generation winery owner passed down from his great grandfather. And he's like, why are you breaking up the ice? And I go, well, when it's smaller ice, like bars in America, it has to hold up on ice. And they thought I was crazy, of course. So long story short, we formulated it, uh, the red and the white, the rosé, all to go on ice and to hold up for a good, you know, 15 minutes, like a, any cocktail out there on ice. Uh, I, I'd say it probably holds up better than most cocktails, actually. But, you know, that's, of course, my personal opinion, but it holds up very well. And that that quality, that being able to hold up on ice and then actually having a consistent product. And I know we're jumping around a little bit, but it's the consistency of the product and the value that this product gives both the consumer, but also retail establishments like bars and restaurants. That That's correct. And, and then Sangria is here, like now being in the market the better part of 10 years, we don't come across a lot of competition of other competitor ready to pour Sangria as our competition. It's not me that's baking their own version, uh, which we can get into more or they're using leftover wine. So we, we went and we made the red out of a Tempranillo and a Grenache. Uh, the rosé is made of a white Grenache and the white is made about in. So these are all very, very popular uh, quality varietals found in Spain, where in the U.S., if you went to get Tempranillo, you're probably going to start at 12 to 15 bucks a bottle for raw material, oh, yeah. especially California. It's not going to be cheap where we can retail it at that, you know, so... Uh, you know, and it's not that. I mean, Sangria's birthplace is definitely Spain, you know, yeah. not America or some guy's bar, you know. And you, you mentioned one thing that I had to, the, a lot of people's perception of Sangria is like one step away from the trash can punch that we had in college where you just throw everything in there and you get what you get. And sadly, yeah. a lot of bars, that's that's what happens. And they, they wonder, they, you might have a good glass one day and a bad glass the other and the, the next day. That, that's true. So the, the two competitors that we see in this market is exactly what you said. The guy that, you know, he's doing it his way and I make the best sangria. Well, he makes the best tra- trash can punch, uh, mm-hmm. not necessarily sangria. We found sangria to be truthful with no wine in it and they're labeling it sangria, <laughs> uh, but they got vodka or gin or tequila or something in it and fruit juice and grenadine and, you know, exactly what you said, trash can punch. So it's either that version or they've taken leftover wine. Uh, I'm old, you're a little younger than me, but back in my day, when you asked for a glass of wine, they had red and white. Uh, mm-hmm. So now you've got 30, 40 bottles of open wine that's all going to oxidize. And uh, what they do is blend that all together and throw some simple syrup in it, maybe infuse it with fruit for a few days, throw the fruit out, stick some tequila or vodka in it. Usually you'll see a lot of those sangrias like in a big clear 
vat that's half empty and half full. So while they're selling this sangria that I wouldn't necessarily drink and wouldn't advise most to drink, uh, is being oxidized even some more. So it's almost know. the Madeira process where the punch never really ends. They just add tests up to the top. So right. Some total is you might have like a five-year-old sangria. It's oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Or some of them will say, well, we make it to get rid of it. Otherwise, what will we do with our leftover wine? And I'm thinking, well, what do you do with your leftover pizza? You know, <laughs> so, you know, of course they don't look at it that way, but truthfully, I mean, like if it's leftover oxidized wine, throw it out, you know, a, a interesting story. I went to a restaurant here in Temecula's before COVID and I went in, I took my 93 year old mother. I, I look after her, she's a great woman and uh, still drives her car and everything. And anyway, I took her out for brunch on a Sunday and we went to a local place here and I said to the guy, Hey, how did your sand green? He goes, Oh, it's great. Oh, they, it was actually a waitress. Sorry. And, uh, sure enough, they came board me saying, gray. I took a sip and I go, Oh my God, that's really bad. It was made of leftover wine, obviously, but you couldn't drink it, but she wasn't very observant. And I ordered another drink and that sand gray just sat there and, you know, brunch was like 120 bucks. And uh, my mom had one drink and I had two, I had the same gray. I couldn't drink it. Another one, but $120 later. So I go to her and I said, Hey, is the, is, uh, who's your bartender? Who's the guy in charge? Oh, his name is so-and-so and he's in on Tuesday. So I went in to see him on the Tuesday and I said, Hey, uh, he didn't obviously know I sold sangria. And I said, Hey, um, I'd like to talk to you about sangria. He goes, well, we make our own. And I go, okay, well, obviously I knew that and how bad it was. So, but I wasn't there really to get my hard to, to be truthful. I just said, hey, you know, would you mind sampling mine and see what you think? And he goes, well, I already told you I made my own. And the guy wasn't the nicest guy in the world. And, mm -hmm. you know, come on, I'm still a customer. He didn't know that I own a sangria company. So anyway, long story short, he refused to even sample it. And I said, you know, I said, I understand. I said, I just want to help you with your business. I said, I was in here on Sunday and I had probably the worst glass of sangria I've ever had. And obviously you make it out of leftover wine. And he goes, well, I, I rely on our customers to let us know if it's any good or not. I just looked at him like shocked going, my lunch was $120, uh -huh. $16 for a glass of sangria. And you rely on your customers to be your quality control. I mean, just totally shocking. But to be honest, um, that's not so uncommon. You know? It isn't. And the, what's uncommon is for the customer to actually vo vocalize that they didn't like it. He's just going, right. oh, the sangria is not selling well because they don't want to make them feel bad. No, Unless I'm just so bad, they're going to go on Yelp and they're going to talk about it. But the chances, by the time it reaches Yelp, the, the problem is so much bigger than the fact that he didn't hear that feedback. Well, I mean, it's not that if you're the owner of the restaurant, if I own the restaurant and an employee told me that he makes that bad of sangria to sell to my customers and he relies on the quality control department to be the customer who's paying 120 bucks for brunch, he probably might be looking for another job the next day. It's like, seriously? You know, yeah. and, and it's not to belittle the guy, but it's like if somebody's red flagging that maybe there's a problem here, like how much money are you really going to save with that leftover wine for the sake of a couple of dollars to pour the customer a great sangria that you're going to sell for 16 bucks and there's a $2 investment in it. Yeah. And the customer's going to buy two and three of the one I make, uh, mm. which one do you make more money on, you know? So yeah. You were talking in the pre-show about the, 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 I forget the right word, but the, the, the financial, the way it works out financially for your sangria versus making your own, like the financial yeah. breakdown was staggering of the profit potential for oh, yeah. bars and restaurants. Yeah, we we had a, a customer here, they, they're a big customer, um, but not so far away. They were pouring 1,200 glasses of sangria a month. That's pretty big customer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the end of the day, my average customer probably pours between three and 500. But this guy was doing 1,200. And I went and seen him and he said, I hear you got a really good sangria. And uh, I was kind of shocked how much sangria and they made it by hand and they actually made it with some local wines and they actually did a pretty decent job with it. And I said, well, how much money do you have invested in this? And he goes, well, about 50 cents an ounce. So you're putting about six ounces on a 16 ounce glass with ice. So about $3 to make that. And um, I said, okay. So anyway, we're talking and he sampled my sangria and he was very impressed. He goes, man, he goes, this is a great product. And I said, well, we have it in bottles. We have it in bag and box. We have it in cans in the bag and box. It always stays fresh, you know, for six weeks after you open it. He goes, man, we make new sangria every week. He goes, we got three, four hours of labor in it to make these 1,200 glasses. And sometimes we make too much and we got to throw it out. At least he was throwing it out when it was going yeah. on. And he says, sometimes we run out. 
And he goes, Matt, he goes, I like this idea. He goes, we'll never run out. And I said, well, pretty much. And I said, we can put it on a tap handle for you or a bar. Anyway, um, I said, would you mind sampling the yours? So I sampled it and it was okay. I mean, it's not sangria once again. It's a concoction with hard alcohol and some other things in it. But it wasn't bad. So um, a couple of days later, they converted to ours. That customer was 18 months ago. Within 90 days, he went from equivalent to 1,200 glasses to 3,500 glasses. Wow. And he's been running 3,500 to 4,000 glasses a month since. Well, he didn't triple his customer since. But the customers that bought two and three glasses of our sangria white labeled for him. And the product sells itself. This same place has 150 Spanish wines and we outsell all of them. Wow. So we, uh, we, one of the things I wanted to tell you, we're kind of jumping ahead here a little bit, but we just white labeled 1,200 cases and bottles so they could put it through their uh, wine club. And I believe they have upwards of about 10,000 in their wine club. But, you know, the number one selling product of these got, he says, is your sangria. And, you know, it, it's nothing to do with me. It's just a really good product that, you know, they... They just have sangria in their menu. And yeah, you mentioned you mentioned the handmade one was um, you know, fifty cents an ounce and then three to four hours to be making it, plus the spoilage and the waste. Each week. What, where, where does yours break down into like, mine would be under two bucks there? It's under two bucks a glass, about thirty cents an ounce. So yeah. fifty versus thirty. Uh we're not trying to give it away, but we're also making it a really good bridles and you know, like everything. So they've yeah. got about a, maybe a dollar seventy invested and sell it for sixteen. That's amazing. And, and, uh, I, want to, I, I want to talk to you about all the white label stuff, but let me, let's go back a second. Yeah. This idea of like a, a premium sangria imported from Spain, you've got a, what, where did you get that idea? I mean, let's talk to some of our entrepreneurial listeners here. Let's. Okay. It's so, just fascinating. Uh, yeah. A little quick history. I'm a, my, I'm a, I'm a 59 year old ge uh, gentleman and uh, I started my first company when I was 22. I built the equipment for making surgery boards and uh, built it to about eight to $12 million a year here in Temecula. Whoa. And when the EPA shut down a lot of my customers, we had no choice but move it to China. And I uh, got, anyway, here we're doing between eight, 12 million. I was selling to Fortune 500 companies like IBM and McDonnell Douglas and been to 75 countries in my life. So I'm not afraid to jump on a plane, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were doing between eight and 12 million every year. And we're about 13 in the world. And I have five patents from doing that. And a long story short, as the EPA started shutting down a lot of the circuit board shops in this country, we had no choice but live it to China. Mm -hmm. So I built a plant in Suzhou, China, or sorry, in Guangzhou, China. I got it all up and running and sold off that company. And then I get into building off-road race cars and built another plant in Suzhou, China. Mm -hmm. And we built half the car there, the main structure of the car uh, called Predator Off-Road. And we built a couple of hundred off-road dune buggies. They went on to race the Baja 1000 and won it four times in its class. And oh, cool. these were a buggy that you and your son could buy for 30 grand, put five or 10 grand in it and go race the Baja 1000 or whatever, a uh, race around the world. So we had uh, five of them enter the Eco Africa race in Africa. And our cars came in second, third, fourth, four out of the five cars finished a 6,000 mile race. And the number two car, came in three minutes after the number one part that cost 1.3 million to make. Whoa. So we've got a $30,000 bar came in second out of 167 entries. And not only did we come in second, we came in second, third, fourth, and fifth of a 6,000 mile race. So pretty crazy. And one of my customers had ordered a couple of cars for me. He had a sangria in Belgium and that's what drove me to the sangria business. So oh, wow. Nobody had a lot of money. We built 220 of these off-road cars, shipped them all over the world, coincidentally, two to Belgium. And that guy had a sangria company, and me, we, me and him became good friends. And he said, well, what are you going to do when you hang up your uh, coat on buggies? And I said, well, man, I, I don't know. He goes, why, why don't you sell my sangria? And I go, I know nothing about sangria. I know nothing about the wine business, uh -huh. which maybe I should have stayed that way. I said, 2020, just kidding. <laughs> So at the end of the day, uh, long story short, I sampled his sangria and I told him the next time I'm in Belgium, I'll stop in. So I went in and seen that he was doing a pretty fair job. They were selling about a million liters a year to about 3000 accounts. Wow. And I go, man, I can probably sell this in America and knowing nothing about it. I imported it and we sold a couple thousand cases in the first year and just me and knowing nothing about this business. Oh, and for, yeah, uh, that's a couple containers. It's about, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. About, yeah. Well, we actually, we had. Brought in three containers total because we had a lot of oh. other old stuff to go with it, like glassware and umbrellas and all types of stuff. So uh, 
brought that in, sold it. And then he decided he didn't like to sell to Americans anymore. Uh, he was a very strange guy. He, uh, the company he owned uh, in Belgium, uh, he did a million liters a year it's with, in the Flemish side of Belgium only. And I don't know if you've ever seen a map of Belgium, but it's about the size of a postage stamp relative to countries in Europe. So I said, why do you not sell to the French? And he goes, I hate the F in French. I look at him though, and you hate him. That's why you don't sell to him. I mean, not a very smart guy, but anyway, bottom line was a very successful. So we brought it in here. He didn't want to sell it anymore. So oh, was, uh, that was it. That was that original stuff you brought in. Was that from Spain or is that? That was from Spain, he his... but he had a company in Belgium. So it was all made in Spain and actually uh, not knowing it at the time, he bumped it with pure alcohol. So the way it was not, it was really cheap wine. Now only hindsight 2020, as I got to know wine and sangria better, it was made of the cheap wine that all the other cheap wine sangrias that are, we are in the market today at six or 7% alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then he bumped it to bring it up to 15% alcohol with pure alcohol. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't truly a real sangria either. It was a modified version of a, whatever you want to call it, only Hindsight 2020, I didn't know that at the time. I was a virgin to this business, right? So yeah. uh, when he decided he didn't want to do it anymore, I went to Spain and I went to like six different wineries. And uh, the winery that makes my sangria, he goes, I can make you the best sangria in the world, but you can't afford it. I said, try me. <laughs> you got it in Pazmaso. So, you know, they've only been around a little over 200 years, I'm going to say. That's uh, amazing. Winery, they're phenomenal. The awesome people, you know. Um, I even said to him, I says, anybody make a sangria like this in Spain? He goes, nobody wants to pay the money you want to pay. And he says, I don't know sangria like this in Spain or Portugal. And, and Spain and Portugal are not that big. So he knows pretty much everybody. But so nobody's really attempted to do what I did. Um, and, and, and honestly, to really to hold up on ice and to have a really good quality product that just it doesn't exist in America unless you open a bottle of Tempranillo and you're not and make it at all. But I mean, who's going to go buy two twenty dollars bottles of Tempranillo or Ganache and make their own? And they're still not going to make it as good as what we do, I, I feel, because we're making it to a formula and it's always exactly the same. And yeah. And that's so important, for especially for bars and restaurants. They want, That consistency is what keeps people coming back and back. The minute that nobody wants to go, you know, well, uh, rolling the dice, is it going to be good today? You've yeah. got this formula. Now, talk, talk to me about no one's making it like this in the Spanish market, it's been about a decade since I've been to Spain. How, what would the, the Spanish sangria be like versus the way they're producing it other than premium? Within so, the uh, yeah, your basic Spanish sangria that's made in Spain is uh, usually six or seven percent. It's mainly made for the tourists. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, it will come in like, you know, your uh, water bottles, like you probably drink out of every day, a plastic mm -hmm. PPE water. So that's pretty much how most of the sangria is made in Spain. Uh, super cheap, uh, maybe chilled, or maybe put it on a big ice uh -huh. cube, and that's it. Uh, so they the market there is different than here. Here, everybody likes a big cup of ice and a whole thing of sangria. Uh -huh. um, and, and the 6%, you know, it's just more just a refreshing drink, like a little better than a Kool-Aid with uh -huh. uh, alcohol in it. Uh, but that's how the majority of the sangria is made in Spain, and uh, they're making it super cheap, and it's a tourist more of a tourist thing than ever. Uh, he even asked the winery that. I said, why is it, I've probably been to, I don't know, 20, 30 bars. I've been to Spain at least 10 times. And I said, every time I go to a bar, nobody really has a good sangria. He goes, well, even that's all made for the tourists. He goes, if you want a good sangria, you'd have to go to somebody's house. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay. I said, that makes sense. And he said, you know, when they make you a glass of sangria, it's going to cost a little more, but the quality is going to be there. And he said, you're, you're not going to find what you have of anywhere. He says, nobody wants to pay the price. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, to me, there's a reason for a good quality sangria. I mean, it's kind of like comparing your tequilas. There's tequilas for $20 a bottle. And there's tequilas for $170. Mm -hmm. I, I, we're not the $170 bottle of sangria, but we... Well, yeah, re retail price to give our listeners an idea. Yeah, re retail is anywhere from $11.99 to $13.99 for $7.50. In, we're, in not, a, we're not talking about... Albert 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 yeah. I, think, I think total wines are about $10.99 right now. That's not bad at all. Not bad at all. Yeah, I think as people talk talk about premium, 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 and their heads there are thinking forty, fifty dollars. But this is a pretty, pretty everyday price point for something. It, it is. So with some of our competition, um, and there, and I don't want to bring up brands, but some of them are seven percent, and they're mm -hmm. seven ninety nine. Well, mm -hmm. to get to seven percent, I'd have to put forty percent water with mine. Uh -huh. So, and, and theirs isn't made of any varietal that I don't know if anybody could tell it was a varietal anyway, if you had 40% of the water to it, but what, 
what does it taste like? You know, mm-hmm. so, you know, that's all, pretty much all of our competition in America is, is the majority and about, I'm going to say over half the sangrias on the shelf are made in the USA. They're not made in Spain. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of them coming out of Spain, but they're all 7%, which is majorly diluted. Uh, yeah. There's no premium product like this coming out of Spain or made in America that we know of. Well, it's 7%. Of you had ice, suddenly you're drinking something that's like 2 to 3%. It's like less than a... a right. Yeah. Can't imagine that tasting good. Talk to me about the flavor profile of each one of these. So you've got the red, you've got a rosé, and you've got the white. Yeah, you've got the, the the red, the white, and the rosé. And depending on, obviously, who tries it and what they like or don't like, mm-hmm. uh, they obviously all have fruit essence with it. And, and you're going to find this pretty funny. Um, when you put it on the ice, people get this great flavor. They love it. Five minutes later, they try it. They go, oh, my God, I even like it better. Now I feel all these flavors coming out of it. Uh, so depending on what, who you talk to, uh, everybody seems to have a different flavor profile coming out of the exact same glass of Sangria. So, you know, the tasting panel rated us at 91 points on the red and 90 on the other two. And their flavor profile, and I've showed that to other people, they go, well, I don't taste what they taste it. And I think it's kind of funny because it's all the exact same product. Uh-huh. Um, I think it depends upon the palate and who samples it. I think the tasting panel probably has it closest to the right of what they feel it should be and and a majority of people that have tried it, but it's all meant to be refreshing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, everybody says sundresses and patios and uh-huh. venues and, you know, you're, it's, it's meant to be a fun drink. Uh, the only difference is it's a fun quality, you know, decent alcohol drink. And, uh, you know, we, we put it into different places. We put it in the Disney, uh, Epcot. You're going to find this to be funny. Uh, they called up and they said, wanted us in to sample them and we sample them on the red and the white. We did not have the rosé at the point. And uh, they give me an order for uh, 1,200 cases of red on the spot within like 10 minutes. And uh, the guy said, hey, we're going to do the wine festival at Disney. We want to have it as a Mexican Spanish sangria. They put a floater shot at the kill on it, went through 75,000 glasses in six weeks. And they since bought over enough to make a half a million uh, glasses of sangria from us. So you can easily add a floater shot to this if you want. Uh, if you had a floater shot of the peanut butter whiskey, um, the screwball to the red, it tastes like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. What? I, very, that is, very interesting. Now, now, my, now my mind's going weird. Okay. I want to bring you some to your office, but it is amazing. Like where people say they want to make their own sangria, I go, listen, whenever wine, you don't need to do anything. Just buy this, pour it on a glass, sell it to your customers. They'll buy two and three glasses. If you want to do an upsell floater shot, I got some, some floater shots for you. So, because Americans love to make their own sangria. Yeah. Let me show like and they're not really making sangria, they're making trash can munch. Well, let me show you how to have a good sangria, how to pour it, and then if you really want to add something to it to have some fun, hey, do this, you know. Kind of make it your own. Use yours as the base. You can kind of make it your own and, and or if people want to white label it like several customers do, and a lot of people don't know it's our sangria. We'll white label it for a winery, we'll white label it for a you know, whoever wants it. Um, you know, it's 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 pretty simple. You know, I, I tasted a, a very big chain in this country. We'll just say they're in the top four. They have several thousand restaurants uh, right before COVID. And uh, the guy had like five of my competitors sangria there. Well, each one of them, he picked up and took a drink, took a drink, took a drink. Uh, he got to one of our competitors that was in a few chains. And when he sat with it, he goes, man, that's not what they said it was. And then he tried my red sangria and he put it down and he picked it up a second time and he picked it up a third time. And he looks at me and he goes, that's one of the best sangrias I've ever had in my life. He says, you make the best sangria, don't you? And I said, well, I'd like to think we'd make a pretty good one, but coming from you, you know, you manage a couple of thousand restaurants. I'd like to think you know more than I do, you know, uh-huh. obviously. So a very nice guy. And he says, Amen. he goes, that's the kind of drink, he says, that our customers will buy two and three of. He goes, we make our own sangria today by hand, and nobody ever makes it the same from one bartender to the mm-hmm. next. In all of our restaurants, statistically, it's too sweet statistically people will only ever buy one of and and he said your drink is the kind of drink people will buy two and three of and, and i think and drew in my opinion i think a lot of restaurants don't think about that they they focus so much on the restaurant and not as much on the cocktails and if you notice mm-hmm. all these craft cocktail bars are killing it but mm-hmm. they're killing it because they got something special that yeah. people don't have one of uh they have to have a couple like if your favorite cocktail in a bar is whatever that is, you're probably not going to have one of them. You're probably going to have a couple or maybe three. I mean, just a fact of life, you know. That, that's the only place you're going to get it. 
I mean, that's the only place you're going to get it. And then like he, like he said, he's the same and our customers only are only going to sell one entree. He said, we need drinks. We can sell them two and three of uh-huh. So I think a lot of people don't put a lot of thought behind that. No, that, that was huge, you know, and it was interesting information. Cause you know, here's a guy that really knows his stuff that, Hey, they got several thousand restaurants. And it's like, Hey, this all makes sense to me. Yeah. So, yeah. For several yeah. thousand restaurants, let's talk about the white label. What, how how would somebody come to approach you and get into the your white label program? How many cases are we talking about? Do they have to get a container? Or they- no, 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 no. So, and, well, yeah, on bottles, if they want it bottled with their stuff on it, would be a minimum of six hundred cases. We mm-hmm. definitely like to see twelve hundred, uh, but six hundred cases of bottles, and we can do red, white, and rosé on that, and do a mixed, you know, bag mm-hmm. on that one. Uh, what we did here, um, and we could start anybody off with, is uh, sell them the bag and box. Uh, put it on a draft handle, put it within a facade box that we have. Uh, so nobody knows it's ours. Um, and they pour it right from the bag and box. The huge advantage of keeping it in the bag and box is when you open that, it's good for up to six weeks and it's always going to stay fresh. I am so but, happy that bag in the box is finally the stigma of it. I mean, it, it, like five, six years ago, people would not even touch it. They just assumed it was crap wine. No, this year, last year, Tablas Creek, one of my favorite wineries up in, um, Paso Robles, they just started producing their um, Pat Linda Tablas, which is their $30 wine in, yeah. in three liter boxes, which is perfect because yeah. it's a little bit of a discount. And even as a consumer, I can now, well, it also makes the recycling bin look a little less stupid when I take it out of the, on right. <laughs> the end of the week. There's a little less bottles in there, but. Um, right. It's a little less bottles. I like that. Yeah. It, it, it helps you hide your consumption a little bit, but that's another story. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it also keeps the wine fresh and it's, it's, it's so much nicer. I'm so happy that it's the stigma. Right. And, and a lot of people, to be honest, don't know that. Like when I go into a bar, I'll bring bottles, I'll bring a bag of box. And the, and the, you know, years ago, if I went with a bag of box three, four years ago, they'd throw me out. Now you go in and say, I got this a bag of box. I'll say, we'll take it because they realize it's going to stay fresh from the first glass to the last glass. Yeah. We tell people six weeks, probably a little more than that. But at the end of the day, that's really hard to beat. So there's no waste, you know, and, and another little thing too, which uh, to give you an idea. So obviously Eamon McDonald would be just a wee bit Irish. You know, I grew up uh-huh. in Ireland as a kid. So uh, in Ireland or even here, if you go to order a pint of Guinness here, a pint of Guinness costs that bar about two bucks to make it. They're going to sell it for eight or 10. Mm-hmm. A glass of sangria costs less and it's going to sell in the same bar for 12 to 14 because uh, your wife or girlfriend, she gets a glass of sangria if she wants it. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, relative to your pint of Guinness. So there's a high perceived value on a pint of sangria or a 16 ounce wine glass of sangria as opposed to a six ounce pour of wine. Hence why a lot of our customers, like they sell a boatload of sangria. I was in interviewing a customer last week. He goes, and they're not a big company. They're a little wine, a little, um, Mediterranean restaurant, they had 12 wines. And I said, well, how does our sangria sell against the 12 wines? She goes, well, we buy more of your sangria and we sell more of your sangria than all 12 of them combined. And she says, they're all good wines. But she said, you outsell all of them. And we see that where the sangria is put in the menu, it's marketed properly. It doesn't have to have my name on it. I always tell them, put our name on it, authentic Spanish sangria. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people have a stigma. And, and what I see at the wine festivals we go to, um, I sent you a video earlier on a wine festival and, and mm-hmm. uh, at Santa Barbara, Dana Point, we'll pour 12 to 1400 glasses in four hours and we'll have a line of maybe, you know, anywhere from 40 to 80 people deep. And the number one thing people come up to me when they try my sangria is they go, oh my God, that's not what I thought it was going to be. And I go, what do you think? I already, I mean, I already asked the question 500 times. I thought it was going to be a sugar bowl mm-hmm. and it's not, it's, you know, a little bit. On the sweeter side, but not overly sweet. I would, people always say, "How do you describe it?" I said, "Put a teaspoon of, of sugar on your coffee." There, there's how sweet it is. So it's not overly sweet. Uh, meant to go on a glass of ice. But the biggest thing is, and it, and it is a hard thing for us as a company, is that we have to overcome all the bad glasses of sangria you had before you got to me. Yeah, and because nobody goes, "Oh my God, they have the best sangria on the planet." Uh, very few people have got to tell me that yet. Uh, which is interesting, but in our booth, they're like, this is the best angry I've ever had. I hear it every day, especially we're going to do a big San Diego wine festival this weekend. Mm-hmm. Probably four or 1400 glasses there in four hours. And we'll have a line, you know, 60, 80 people deep going, this is the best angry I've ever had. And the crazy part about it is why didn't they ever have a good glass of sangria before? And yeah. 
You know, if you ask people, what's your brand of Sangria? Nobody can tell you. If I ask you what your brand of vodka or gin is, you probably got a favorite brand. Mm -hmm. So very few people can say, well, yeah, this brand's my favorite. I don't even know of a brand. I hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting, you know? It, absolutely fascinating. On, on twofold, pro, you've got first building this brand and by the name Pausmosa, and then also helping bars, empowering them through that white label process just to kind of create their own um, sub brand using yeah, your because if, your product. If they buy if they buy the bag of mocks, they put it right on a draft handle or a bar gun and nobody even knows it's mine. So to get them going, that's the best. And to answer that question, they could buy one case of red or white or rosé or one of each and and nobody knows it's even our brand and let them go sell it if they really want to have their own sangria. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. you know, and then obviously if they really get going, you know, I, I have one particular customer and he's moving through about, I don't know, 30 cases of mine, a bag of mugs. And he said, what about bottles? I said, wait till next year. Uh -huh. he looks, he goes, you don't want my order. I said, I want to see you grow and build your wine base. And as you do then next year, you know, I'll come see you and make it. He goes, you really don't want my order. I said, let's be paid. Hey. So he, he right just time. gave me an order yesterday for a half a container, right. but I saw him not to about four months ago. So nice. I said, if you're going to order, wait till November and we'll have it for you by April because we still have the TTB approve of it and, you know, all the label and everything that he wants. So we'll design, start designing his label next week. And the process is, you know, four to six months realistically by the time it hits your doorstep. I just tell people six months if you say. That's interesting. I, I've got a question from a, personal standpoint i'm sure our customers or our, our listeners do too but i used to import wine it, but that was before the bag in the box time when you import the bag do you import the wines in vats and then put it in the bags here or do you import the bags from spain no like, i import wine totally already finished. in the bags totally finished so the wine's already in a box and there's four or five liters in a case okay uh, we can do a 30 liter keg a disposable keg in a case the bottles are, are already done and they're all packaged and done. And I'll bring some of these down to you. You're not so far from me. So yeah, no, we're here we're in the next 30 week. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's, yeah. that's, that's interesting. So it's all finished in Spain and imported here. All Is there a possibility of bringing in like a. No, uh, no problem at all. About six weeks from the day I ordered to the day I get it, it's about six weeks, uh, six to seven weeks. That's it. So quick. And we could do a container a day where you got an unlimited capacity. Oh, wow. And that's they that's so important for restaurants and bars. Once they get a wine or, or something on their list, they need that consistency. They don't want to run out because then they have to reprint their lists. Oh yeah, no, I have uh, three to five thousand cases at all times in stock, so we never run out. Uh, we never run out yet in ten years. You know, we just keep accelerating more volume that we we want to have at least a six month supply in stock at all times. Yeah, we were, we were talking earlier uh, before the show about. Once it gets on people's lips, it, it's a, it's an easy sell. It's getting them on the list, lips. And as you were trying to promote the company and promote Pasmora, that you had a story about a wine, one wine event there. They didn't know that you should even show up to, but you showed up and then they were begging you to come back. Yeah. So this was funny. I, I don't want to say the name, but one of the wine festivals, they wanted 1600 bucks for us to go to that. And I said, I'm not paying 1600 bucks. You guys are nuts. Anyway, long story short, I hired a gal in that area like a year later, and she goes, you know, you should really come to this wine festival. And I go, I'm not paying them 1600 bucks. I said, I'll give away, you know, $2,000 for Sangria this show. I, I don't, you know, if they went to buy it. I said, I, I'm not paying. So anyway, it was fun date, you know, stubborn Irishman. So anyway, she says, listen, I got the gal to say she'd do it for 200 bucks. I said, well, okay, for 200, we'll do it, you know? So, and it's a hike. It's a three hour, four hour drive from here. So I drop down there and we set up our tent. Uh, they get about three, three and a half thousand people at their wine festival. And um, we set up and we started pouring sangria. We had over 50 people in line within a half hour. And I talked to this gal on the phone. Her name was Emily. And Emily, was, I'm a six foot one big guy. Uh, she's a little five foot, you know, sweetheart. And she walks up to me and she goes, are you Avon? And I go, are you Emily? And she goes, you're never paid to come here again. You can come anytime you want. We're the number one hit of the show. And every time we go to a wine festival, we usually are the number one hit of the show. That we pour a decent pour, but it's a refreshing, it's a warm summer's day. It's sort of a no-brainer, you know. Um, we've been to several shows, uh, you know, and, and everybody's like, Oh my God, you got a hell of a brand there. So, you know, like everything, it's liquid the lips. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had guys walk up up to me with their girlfriend or maybe their wife, and uh 
I got, I got to tell you that story. That happened at that festival. Anyway, all guys walk up to me and they have a beer in their hand. I'll say, here, let me trade that beer out for a sangria. Hey, dude, I don't drink wine. I said, you might drink this. I put a sangria in their hand. They put down the beer and go, hey, I'm not going to bring the rest of the day. So I had this wine festival. They, actually, it was that festival, the first festival. And it, uh, of course, I'm a guy, you know? So there's these two little honeys from Kentucky. Yeah. They could pass off as sisters. And one was the mom and one was the uh, daughter. And uh, they come up and get a glass of sangria. They walk to the back of the line, come back up again, walk to the back of the line, come back up again. Now they're on their like fifth glass of sangria. And I got a line 50 people deep. So anyway, this guy, because I'm six one, well, there's a bigger guy than me, you tend to notice him. So this guy walks up with the two girls, and that's the dad. And uh, the dad's like six six, six seven, and he's got a heavy Kentucky accent. And he goes, Man, he says, You got the best shit here. And, you know, I just started laughing, and he goes, he said, my girls just love this in his heavy Kentucky accent. So he said, can you give me a pallet of this shit for tomorrow? And I look at him, I go, you know, out of curiosity, uh, if I could get you a pallet of this shit for tomorrow, what would you do with it? He goes, well, I got one of them there layer jets. I'll put it on it and take it home. <laughs> I literally about fell out of the chair. This guy can buy any Napa Valley or Sandro Valley wine at this festival. And there's got to be at least 50, 60 wineries there. And they're all Napa or Central Valley, some Temecula wines there, but uh, some of the best wines in the whole region. He wants to buy a pallet of this shit, as he called it. So, <laughs> you know, all just in, you know. Uh, but I, I thought it was so funny. And I go, yeah, I, I don't feel like losing my licenses right now to see if I can get you a pallet to move it to where. But uh, he's bought a tennis anchor from from us since. And we shipped it to him legally, of course, to Tennessee. But sure. There's a, that's one of the funniest stories, of course. Uh, but you know, here's his, his wife and his girlfriend can, I think they can probably afford whatever they want to drink. And, you know, at the best of those two is interesting because everything's free anyway. You pay a hundred, 120 bucks to get in. You can drink whatever you want. So why aren't you drinking, you know, some of the really popular Napa Valley wines and they, and they do, they go around and sample a little bit of it all, but then they end up in my line, a big majority of the festival, obviously to pour. You know, twelve, fourteen hundred glasses, and four. They, they need a pallet cleaner. Yeah, you know, yeah. So, I've been to those festivals. You can get pallet fatigue very quickly, and I would appreciate yeah. having a nice crisp sangria. To yeah, so and so it's really cool. You know, I, 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 we love going to it, of course, and and obviously I don't pay anything to go to these festivals mm -hmm. anymore. That's but uh, I paid two hundred bucks once. But uh, anyway, they're, they're good people. You know, all yeah. good people. You know. So you're getting the word out, spreading it, spreading the footprint, looking for restaurants and, you know, any hospitality industries to get your line. Um, where can people find out more who may be in the industry looking to add this to their portfolio or add this to their lineup? Yeah. So we, uh, a couple of things. We would love to get some local distributors, the big distributors like our in DC and Southern. Uh, I don't think we're the right fit for them. Um, as you know, the distribution work it, in the last 10 years has changed a lot. We still got to build the brand no matter where we go. Mm -hmm. If I'm interested in maybe microcosm distributors, it would make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, white label for the right people that make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm all ears on all of it. Uh, if they go to our website or, you know, you can give them my email and stuff on here or whatever, I'm happy to mm -hmm. talk about it. Uh, they can reach out to us. We'd love to hear from them. Um, at bars and restaurants, uh, what we're going to do now is create an email campaign and uh, marketing out to bars and restaurants to drive more of that business and wineries. Mm. Uh, what's really interesting is a lot of the wineries out here, they're doing like a frosé oh, yeah. the other day, uh, you know, all these wineries have this frosé and I'm like, why are you doing a frosé? And, uh, and they'll do like a shot of wine on top of the frosé. Well, the frosé is made of wine and you can't sell a customer a bottle of frosé to go. But if we, if they sold our sangria, they could sell a bottle of our sangria to go. Uh, and some of these wineries are, will sell it for $29 and wow. it does cost them a third of that, you know, even brand labeled with their name on it. So I'm like, you know, this whole frosé thing is crazy that if you're driving these younger generation people in for their weddings or whatever, and you're born on frosés, well, how are you selling them something after they leave? Where if they poured them a really good glass of sangria and got rid of the frosé machine, They'll automatically make more money and because they're going to sell them bottles to go or put it in their wine club, you know? Yeah. It's not, that's kind of amazing out here. Like I, I'm going to tell you, I know at least a half a dozen wineries selling frosés. I'm like, why would you go to drink? It's like a Slurpee. With a yeah. It, ma it makes sense on a hot day, but if you've got that sangria on ice, then that's even a better alternative because you can recreate that. You brought up it, the best points against selling frosés. Customer can't recreate that at home. 
No, and, and they can't. And the rosé is never going to be the same either. And and one of the wine reviews I talked to, they said, "Well, we've got two thousand cases of wine that's going bad." Um, and, and what are we going to do with this? Do we make the rosés out of it? And I'm looking at them going, this sounds like the same story I hear in some bars. We got stuff going bad. That's yeah. Like make sangria out of it. And, and you wonder why sangria has a bad reputation with the typical consumer. And I'm just in my head going, seriously? Like, yeah, maybe make something good they're going to want to buy more of. And, and, you know, another interesting thing too is if you look at the cost of a good sangria is under two bucks, right? right. And if you make your own homemade sangria with labor and everything else, do you have 50 cents or a dollar in it, right? Let's, let's just say you got 50 cents in it. Uh-huh. You sell it for eight bucks. Well, what if you sell it for 10 bucks and you pay me less than two to make a quality sangria and you sell that same customer three glasses of sangria? Yeah. If it's only $10, you just sold 30 bucks, it costs you six. That 50 cent, and the guy never bought a second glass, how much business did you just lose? And it was never going to be the same from glass to glass. Mm-hmm. Or sangria to sangria. It makes sense to take that leftover oxidized wine and chuck it, mm-hmm. charge an extra dollar or two for a really good glass of sangria. Mm-hmm. And if you're paying me two bucks and you sell it for 10 versus take leftover stuff and sell it for eight, my sangria just became free. Because uh-huh. yeah, you paid me two bucks, but you got $8 profit in your pocket. Uh-huh. And you got to sell an authentic better sangria. Math mm-hmm. makes sense. No brainer. No well, brainer. Eamon, well, before we go here, is there anything else you'd like to talk about that we haven't discussed? No, I, I, I really do appreciate Drew giving us the opportunity to talk about it and uh, my first podcast. So uh, I don't know what to tell you. Hopefully I pass. Oh, but, yeah, uh, anyway, fantastic yeah, conversation. You're, you're a hell of a nice guy. You give me some great leads in the business. Um, definitely look forward to doing business with you here in the new, near future. Uh, hopefully, you know, if not, you've definitely got to be in the right direction. But I, I think we're going to do business together. And most importantly, I got to get you something right here in the next Absolutely. week. I, yeah, I'm dying to try it. Yeah, no problem. Well, Eamon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Have a great rest of your day. And great. good luck on the wine, com- the wine meeting uh, this weekend. The weather is going to be great. Oh, yeah. It's going to be beautiful. I think it's going to be like 75. And San Diego Food and Wine Festival, they're saying about 5,000 people, 51 mm-hmm. restaurants. That's oh, in your backyard, not that far away. That'd be a great one to come to. If you come to it, hook me up. You know, I'll hook you up. No, I may see you there. So okay. thank you. Have a good All day. Right, thank you. Bye right, bye. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Mm-hmm.